the temporal bone will be discussed in two sets of videos. In this video, we will cover the side determination and out of the five parts, two parts will be discussed in this video. The remaining three parts of the temporal bone will be discussed in the next video. Temporal bones are paired cranial bones. This is one temporal bone and this is the other temporal bone. The temporal bone are irregular in shape and forming the lateral wall of the skull. Also, the temporal bone has contribution in both the middle cranial fossa and the posterior cranial fossa. This is the middle cranial fossa and this is the contribution of the temporal bone in the middle cranial fossa. Same, this is the posterior cranial fossa and this is the part of the temporal bone contributing to the posterior cranial fossa. This is the left temporal bone with the interior view, lateral view, posterior view, medial view, the inferior view and the superior view. Now we came to the side determination of the temporal bone. For the side determination, you have to remember three main points. This is the external acoustic meatus and it should be on the external surface. This is the zygomatic process and it should be directed interiorly. Since this is the lateral view, this is the interior side. Number three, this is the styloid process and it should be directed downward. So this is the left temporal bone. Now looking at the right temporal bone, making the external acoustic meatus on the external surface, the zygomatic process is directed interiorly and the styloid process is pointed downward. So this is the right temporal bone. Now we came to the five parts of the temporal bone. For that we will take the left temporal bone as a representative. Looking at the lateral view, this smooth and flat is the squamous part. Posterior to it, this is the mastoid part. Now looking at the inferior view, this is the tympanic part. In the inferior view of the complete skull model, this is the temporal bone. And this triangular plate structure is the tympanic part of the temporal bone. Now looking at the posterior superior view, this is the petrous part. And again looking at the lateral view, this is the styloid part, also called as the styloid process. The first one is the squamous part. This is the squamous part of the temporal bone. And as you can see, the squamous part is flat bony plate. It has two surfaces and two borders. The two surfaces are the outer surface and the inner surface. And the two borders are the superior border and the interior inferior border. First, we will discuss the surfaces. The first one is the outer surface, also called as the external surface. In the outer surface, there are three important landmarks. The zygomatic process, this process is the zygomatic process. The mandibular fossa, this mark area is the mandibular fossa. And number three, the articular tubercle. This marked yellow area is the articular tubercle, which is present interior to the mandibular fossa. On the external surface is present a groove. And this groove lodges the middle temporal artery. This hole is the external surface of the squamous part. And this yellow part of the external surface contribute to the temporal fossa. In complete skull model, this whole red area is the temporal fossa. And this highlighted yellow area is the contribution of the external surface of the squamous part to the temporal fossa. The squamous part of the temporal bone which contribute to the temporal fossa is bounded posteriorly by the supramiatal crest. Over here is present the supramiatal crest. About 1.5 cm behind the supramiatal crest, an imaginary line separates the squamous part from the mastoid part. This imaginary line is actually a suture which gets fused later in life. And this suture is called mastosquamosal suture. In this diagram, this is the remaining of the mastosquamosal suture. This is the squamous part of the temporal bone. Now if you observe carefully, you will notice that the roof and the upper half of the posterior wall of the external acoustic meatus is formed by the squamous part of the temporal bone. This hole is the external acoustic meatus. The external acoustic meatus has a roof, a floor, interior wall and a posterior wall. The roof and the upper half of the posterior wall of the external acoustic meatus is contributed by the outer surface of the squamous part of the temporal bone. So if you draw a tangent passing through the posterior wall of the external acoustic meatus, so between 
supramestoid crest, the tangent, and the posterior superior margin of the external acoustic meatus, a triangle is formed called the Mequon triangle or supramietal triangle. This triangle is important because deep to this triangle is present the mastoid antrum. And this triangle is an important landmark in the mastoidectomy surgery. Mastoid antrum is air space present inside the temporal bone. This is the mastoid antrum. And over here is present the Mequon triangle. And as you can see, deep to this triangle is present the mastoid antrum. Anterior inferior to this triangle, sometime you may see a bony specule called the supramietal spine. In front of the external acoustic meatus, the squamous part form a process called the zygomatic process. This is the zygomatic process of the temporal bone and it is attached to the temporal process of the zygomatic bone. As you can see, the zygomatic process of the temporal bone is attached to the temporal process of the zygomatic bone and together they complete the zygomatic arch. Now looking at the zygomatic process, it is further divided into three parts. The proximal part, the middle part and the distal part. The proximal part shows concavity on the upper surface as you can see and in this concavity is present the tendon of the temporalis muscle. In this model, this is the temporalis muscle and this whitish part is the tendon of the temporalis muscle. And as you can see, it is present in the concavity of the proximal part of zygomatic process. The middle part of the zygomatic process has two borders and two surfaces. The two surfaces are the outer surface and the inner surface. And the two borders are the upper border and the lower border. The last one is the distal part of the zygomatic process. This is the distal part of the zygomatic process. The distal end of the zygomatic process is serrated and through this serrated margin it is attached to the temporal process of the zygomatic bone. As you can see the serrated margins of the two bone are interlocking with each other. Now looking at the inferior view of the zygomatic process then you can see that it split into two roots the interior root and the posterior root. At the junction of the interior and posterior root there is present a tubercle called tubercle at the root of zygoma. The name tells us everything. Tubercle which is present at the junction of the root of the zygomatic process. This tubercle will provide attachment to the lateral ligament of the temporomandibular joint. This is the lateral ligament of the temporomandibular joint attached to the tubercle at the root of zygoma. You can also see this ligament from the lateral view. As you can see, this ligament is more clear on the lateral view. And this ligament attaches the temporal bone to the mandible bone. This is the mandibular fossa, where the temporomandibular joint is formed. Over here is attached the head of the mandible. As you can see, the head of the mandible bone attached to the mandibular fossa of the temporal bone. This mandibular fossa is bounded interiorly by the interior root of the zygomatic process while it is bounded laterally by the posterior root of the zygomatic process. The posterior root most posteriorly will form a tubercle called the postglenoid tubercle. This red is the postglenoid tubercle and it is present between the external acoustic meatus and the mandibular fossa. In the lateral view, this is the postglenoid tubercle. And as you can see, this postglenoid tubercle is present close to the external acoustic meatus. Now in complete skull model, this is the postglenoid tubercle. And this postglenoid tubercle prevent the posterior dislocation of the head of the mandible in the temporomandibular joint. In the inferior view, this hole is the posterior root. Now if you look this posterior root from the lateral view, then this is the posterior root in the lateral view. This is the upper border of the posterior root and this is the lower border of the posterior root. The upper border of the posterior root is continuous posteriorly with the supramestoid crest and interiorly the upper border of the posterior root is continuous with the superior border of the zygomatic process. Now we came to the mandibular fossa also called as the glenoid fossa.
This hole is the mandibular fossa and in the mandibular fossa is present the head of the mandible. As you can see, the head of the mandible articulate with the temporal bone in the mandibular fossa. We divide the mandibular fossa into two parts, the interior part and the posterior part. And in between the interior and posterior part, there is present a fissure called the pterotympanic fissure, also called as the squamotympanic fissure or glycerian fissure. The interior part is the articular area of the mandibular fossa and it is the area where the head of the mandible is present. And the interior part of the mandibular fossa is contributed by the squamous part of the temporal bone. Next is the posterior part of the mandibular fossa. The posterior part of the mandibular fossa is contributed by the tympanic plate and this is a non-articular area. The last thing in the external surface is the articular tubercle. This highlighted blue is the articular tubercle. It is present anterior to the mandibular fossa. Now when the mouth is protruded, the head of the mandible move forward and when it move forward, it came in contact with the articular tubercle. That's why it is called the articular tubercle because in protruded mouth, the head of the mandible articulate with the articular tubercle. That's all about the external surface. Now we came to the internal surface of the squamous part. This is the internal surface of the squamous part. The internal surface is also called the cerebral surface. Below the cerebral surface merge with the interior surface of the petrous part of temporal bone. This is the petrous part of the temporal bone. This is the interior surface of the petrous part of temporal bone. And as you can see, the internal surface is continuous with the interior surface of the petrous part of temporal bone. Sometime you may find a suture separating these two parts of the temporal bone. And that suture is called petrosquamous suture. The internal surface will form part of the lateral boundary of the middle cranial fossa. This hole is the middle cranial fossa and as you can see the internal surface of the squamous part of the temporal bone contribute to the lateral boundary of the middle cranial fossa. On the inner surface is attached the temporal lobe of the brain. In this model I have made the temporal bone translucent so you can appreciate the temporal lobe of the brain. This highlighted portion is the temporal lobe of the brain and this light green is the temporal bone and as you can see the inner surface of the squamous part of temporal bone is attached to the temporal lobe of the brain. On the inner surface of the squamous part is present surface irregularities and these are produced by the gari of the temporal lobe of the brain. Also there are present vascular marking produced by the middle meningeal vessels and its branches. As you can see in this model, this highlighted red is the middle meningeal artery and this highlighted green is the temporal bone. So the middle meningeal artery and its branches will produce vascular marking on the inner surface of the squamous part of temporal bone. Now we came to the borders of the squamous part. The first one is the superior border. This is the superior border. This superior border is convex in nature and the convexity of this border is facing upward and it articulate with the parietal bone via the squamous suture. In complete skull model, this is the superior border and as you can see, it articulate with the parietal bone via the squamous suture. Next is the interior inferior border. The interior inferior border join with the squamosal border of the greater wing of sphenoid bone. This is the sphenoid bone and this is the squamosal border of the greater wing of sphenoid bone. And as you can see, the interior inferior border articulating with the squamosal border of the greater wing of sphenoid bone. You can also see this articulation on the lateral surface, the interior inferior border joining the squamosal border of the greater wing of sphenoid bone. Next is the mastoid part of the temporal bone. This hole is the mastoid part of the temporal bone. The mastoid part has two surfaces and two borders. That is the external surface and the internal surface. And the two borders are the, the superior border and the posterior border. First we will discuss the external surface. The external surface is rough in nature and below it is continuous as mastoid process. This hole is the 
mastoid process. Mastoid process is actually a bony elongation. And this mastoid process itself has an outer surface and an inner surface. The outer surface of the mastoid process provide attachment to the sternocleidomastoid muscle. This is the sternocleidomastoid muscle. And as you can see, the attachment of the sternocleidomastoid muscle is on the external surface of the mastoid process. This blue is the attachment of sternocleidomastoid muscle. Now we came to the inner surface of the mastoid process. Since this is the inferior view, this hole is the inner surface of the mastoid process. And there are present two important structures on the inner surface of the mastoid process. The first one is the digastric notch. This mark red is the digastric notch, also called as the mastoid notch. It is called digastric notch because it provides attachment to the posterior belly of the digastric muscle. This is the posterior belly of the digastric muscle. And as you can see, it is attached on the inner surface of the mastoid process. Medial to the digastric notch is present a groove. This yellow groove will lodge the occipital artery. As you can see, the occipital artery present in the groove. Now we came to the internal surface of the mastoid process. This is the internal surface of the mastoid process. The internal surface of the mastoid process will contribute to the posterior cranial fossa. This hole is the posterior cranial fossa. And this is the internal surface of the mastoid part contributing to the posterior cranial fossa. The internal surface is continuous with the posterior surface of the petrous part of temporal bone. Since this is the internal surface and this is the petrous part of the temporal bone. This is the posterior surface of the petrous part of temporal bone. And as you can see, the internal surface is continuous with the posterior surface of the petrous part. On the internal surface is present part of the sigmoid sulcus. This highlighted blue is the sigmoid sulcus. And this part of the sigmoid sulcus will lodge the sigmoid sinus. In this model, this highlighted blue is the sigmoid sinus. And if I remove it, then this hole is the sigmoid sulcus. And this part of the sigmoid sulcus is present on the temporal bone. On the inner surface, close to the sigmoid sulcus is present a foramen. This foramen opens on the external surface is the mastoid foramen. And in the mastoid foramen, two structure passes. The emissary vein and the mastoid branch of the occipital artery. First one is the emissary vein. This highlighted blue is the emissary vein originating from the occipital vein. And this emissary vein is inside connected to the sigmoid sinus. As you can see, this is the sigmoid sinus. So in other words, this emissary vein connect the sigmoid sinus from the inside to the occipital vein from the outside. As you can see, the next structure that passes through the mastoid foramen is the mastoid branch of the occipital artery. In this model, this is the occipital artery and a branch from this artery passes through the mastoid foramen and that branch is called mastoid branch of the occipital artery. Next is the two borders of the mastoid part. The first one is the superior border. The superior border is attached to the inferior border of the parietal bone. As you can see, this is the superior border attached to the inferior border of the parietal bone. And this suture between the superior border of the mastoid part and the parietal bone is called parietomastoid suture. Next is the posterior border of the mastoid part. This hole is the posterior border of the mastoid part. And it is attached to the occipital bone. This suture between the posterior border of the mastoid part and the occipital bone is called occipitomastoid suture. Now this area where the occipital bone parietal bone and the temporal bone meet each other is called asterion. Inside the mastoid part of the temporal bone is present the mastoid air cells. The mastoid air cells open upward into the mastoid antrum. Now that's all about the mastoid part of the temporal bone. In the next video, we will begin with the tympanic part. Thank you.